also talked about that kaam ho gaya hai that in the black transparency is parallelly increasing so what will be the use of the basal third we are moving towards that well, if mean, the same thing is happening in india aapka yeah. kaam ho gaya hai so basal third i think will not work i think okay right yeah go ahead okay yeah. sorry when you say right what do you mean by that <laughs> <laughs> questions over <laughs> okay yeah. so do you want an answer yeah no, you do, you do. okay yeah. fine yeah. absolutely um <laughs> you know the minimum capital requirements are as laid down by the law by regulators uh behavior and conduct cannot be laid down by regulators not beyond a point right you can't legislate on every single aspect and therefore you know you have this situation where behavior and conduct right is sometimes inimical to maintaining the minimum amount of capital you know if you look at the corporate governance debate the way it's emerged in academia there are essentially two components to it one is boards of directors must make sure that managers are not benefited at the expense of shareholders and boards of directors must also make sure that minority shareholders are not shortchanged vis-a-vis -vis controlling shareholders right i mean these are really two big themes in the corporate governance debate in india you have a slightly different corporate governance prob uh, problem where third party agents steal right from the bank apparently occasionally with connivance for people sitting on the boards so the boards of directors rather than being the custodians of shareholders actually participate apparently from the narrative that i've just repeated of bankers participate in a third party entity being able to steal from the bank so everything which is tantamount to a grey loan being given is is stealing right because you're essentially giving a loan to an entity that you would not normally give it to so there is no guarantee that productivity and output in the economy will grow mm. and all you will end up with are uh, non performing assets at the end of it so the bank has been shortchanged by a third party entity which has stolen from it so i think we need the debate on corporate governance to have distinguishing indian features as well and i hope you know chetan and others will begin thinking about this so that you know we uh, we end up with good economic research on how gov misgovernance operates in india okay germany yeah jayendra thank you that was uh, extremely useful and illuminating uh, i agree with most of what you say particularly in terms of appointment of directors and chairman of public sector banks but having said that i agree with you that they have to uh, compete fight with not just one hand perhaps both hands tied behind their backs but there are some other aspects which um, of banking in india which allows private sector banks to go laughing all the way to their own <laughs> banks in terms of profits i mean just the deposit rate and lending rates those spreads are perhaps amongst the highest in the world uh private sector banks most of these private sector banks i think duration on their assets is usually not more than 3 years public sector banks are expected to lend and there they might be fair pressure fair in the sense of transparent pressure or some pressure is not so transparent so when you look at what's been happening around the world so while we do these changes in terms of uh, getting separate entities completely divorced from government making the appointments i'm not entirely clear looking at international experience that this time it will be different i'm referring to reinhardt and reinhardt 800 years of uh, uh banking in various forms obviously banking as it exists today didn't exist even 200 years ago but episode after episode in uh, jurisdictions which have a preponderant majority of private sector banks whether it is snl leading up to the financial sector meltdown of 2008 so given that uh if you look at the last 15 years i think private sector banks around the world have been guilty of actually despite all the checks and balances and controls uh it's the management which has benefited not even the shareholders if you look at the shareholders of city bank 
or a look at the shareholders of Deutsche Bank. It is actually management. So while I don't grudge private sector bankers their three and a half crores per annum as uh, compared to 18 lakhs for the public sector bank or whatever, <laughs> somehow something seems to be wrong, out of whack, when management allocates to itself such large amounts, particularly when they are actually taking bets, sometimes leverage bets. I'm talking more generally now, not just in India. Uh, in India, of course, you know, interest rate swap markets, selling derivatives to public sector companies. That's one of the fortes of the private sector uh, foreign banks in India. If you look, drill down deep into where their profits are coming from. So now looking at it slightly broader, but not the subject of your yeah. talk, not just the issue of how to improve public sector banks. And I think you're spot on. You have to get government out of appointing these people including what you call parachuting in these board members. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Okay, I agree with everything you said, but was there a question at the end of it? <laughs> <laughs> the, the question is this, the, que the question is this, Jendra, that you know, your solutions somehow give a sense for our public sector banks yeah. that once you've done this, yeah. and you've given everybody three and a half crores uh, per annum, uh, we are fine now, banking will be fine, nobody will no, no, take I don't, I don't leverage think bets. No, I, I would agree with you there, right? Uh, somehow I, one got that I, impression. I think, you know, adverse selection and moral hazard are intrinsic to financial markets, <laughs> right? Completely intrinsic to it. And we know that financial markets tend to malperform in all kinds of ways, which we are discovering every day, right? Uh, and certainly, uh, the sophistication of these financial products that we've seen overseas makes it possible for them to increasingly malfunction as new products come in. So, you know, there is this view that innovation is terrible in finance, right? I remember meeting with a regulator once after 2008 from one of the European countries who said, each time I hear the word innovation, I reach for my revolver, <laughs> right? R rather reminiscent of what Goebbels, I think, said in respect of culture, right, uh, uh, in uh, Nazi Germany. Um, uh, so, you know, there is this feeling that other than the ATM, right, we really had nothing which has been uh, usefully innovative within finance. So that's a completely different debate. And I think as the Indian banking system becomes more sophisticated, we need to, at every stage, ask this question of ourselves, learning from what's happened in other markets. But remember, 2008, we were unaffected. The Indian banking system was uninjured. Right? Because we didn't have those products. We just didn't have the kind of products that dismantled a whole set of banks uh, in the West. Now, I'm not saying, you know, I, th I think there's a lot of malpractice today in the banking system. I think there's a lot of it in the private sector banking system as well. Uh, I, 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 I think uh, levels of integrity are not as high as they should be. And some of, some of this actually creates a great deal of concern uh, that uh, you can't hold up the private sector banks as a model for public sector banks to follow. A lot of people argue that because the private sector banks collapsed overseas, right, you cannot argue in India that the private sector banks are a model, right? And I find this argument um, a little fallacious because overseas you didn't have a counterfactual of being able to compare private sector bank behavior with public sector bank behavior, certainly in the sort of North Atlantic uh, crisis countries, you didn't have that. In India, you do have a counterfactual. You do have public sector banks, and you can compare them with private sector banks, right? And therefore, what you can say about one is relative to what you can say about the other. So I don't think one should make any absolutist statements, right? I think at every stage, regulators need to be equally vigilant. All we are saying is, assuming that the regulator is vigilant about how banks as a whole work over here, please make the playing field a little more level between the public sector banks and the private sector banks. If you read the report, it's actually very empathetic towards public sector banks. It's a little less empathetic about the owner, the principal owner of the public sector banks, right? That's the spirit in which we've done it, and we've done it to the best advantage of trying to get a level playing field for pri uh, public sector banks. Okay, I think I'm gonna cap the Q&A. Um, we're, uh, yeah. we've got strict instructions to um, I think, uh, I think can, maybe there was one final question. Rajat, do we have, we have time? Okay, so a few more. Sorry. 
Yeah, somebody made, wanted to make sure I had a turn. So <laughs> yeah, I was wondering why the government is so stuck on that 50% ownership. Why are they not willing to come below? Because if the main use for public sector banks for them, apart from airdropping directors and giving sh gray loans, has been implementing schemes, whether it is infrastructure, finance, just after the GFC, the public sector banks were forced to provide this as part of the macro stimulus or the Jandhan Yojana, private sector banks will not implement a scheme like that. But some of these have a macro stimulus or a social function. Yeah. So that function could hold even if they had 40% ownership, yeah. but the uh, audit by the CAG would go, yeah. right? Yeah. So yeah. why is that 50% so difficult? Why is it so difficult to get them to come below that? I think there's this feeling that it's tantamount to privatization. I think it's a fallacious feeling. Right, if you go below 50%, you privatize these banks. Affirmative no. action would drop. And uh, still yes, affirmative action would get weakened. But you know, the way to do affirmative action is to really, as we said in our report, to make it applicable to public and private sector banks and to use the Reserve Bank of India as the conduit <coughs> for doing it. You do this today in many schemes. If you look at priority sector lending, right, it's applicable to all banks and it's managed by the Reserve Bank of India. You look at SLR, the statutory liquidity ratio, right? Initially, you could argue that it was genuine, genuinely a liquidity ratio. But as the levels have risen and become so egregious as they have, it's really a way of funding the government. And therefore, it subserves a development purpose, and all banks do it, because SLR is applicable to all banks. So we already have this tradition of development objectives and affirmative action being mediated through the Reserve Bank of India, and that's what should have been done. I think the Jandhan should have been put through all banks. I understand from data that someone gave me that 98% of the accounts have been opened in public sector banks. Again, you've handed over competition on a platter to private sector banks. Why have you done it? Why does the government hand over competition to the private sector banks when it owns its own banks? Just as you've asked me to ask, uh, answer a question, I'm going to ask you to answer that question, Ashima. <laughs> I don't understand this. Why has the no, government done it? There's a perception private banks will not do it because it's not profitable. No, but you know, if you have targets being set for government banks, why can't you set up? Now, if the targets are set through suasion, through phone calls, I think it's wrong, right? Because then you're really disadvantaging the banks. What you're really saying is, I'm making development objectives applicable to a subset of all the banks, right? And I'm going to make sure that that subset does it, but eventually you weaken that subset, right? Because if it's profitable to do it, then private sector banks will do it. And if it's not profitable to do it, they will stay off it. Of course, you're going to weaken the public sector banks in the process, right? So the answer is to make it applicable to everyone. I don't know why the simple logic between the Reserve Bank of India and the government can't be implemented. But it cuts out suasion. You can't ring up, a, ring up a bank chairman and ask them to open X number of accounts in the next one week. And if you have to do it, you have to ring up the private sector bank chairman as well and tell them to do it as well. And that the government won't do. Yeah. Okay. Okay, one, maybe last question, yeah. Uh, thanks. Thank you for the lecture, very nice. Uh, well, basic thing, which the last uh, question I also asked was that at the time of nationalization of the bank, there was a specific requirement of deepening the economy through the banks. Now, as you said, two thirds of assets are with the bank and four times the profits are with the private banks. But is that only because of the crony cronyism going on? Or is it also because that the banks have performed a particular function in India, the public sector banks, which have left to, led to a decline in their profits? Now, and you must discriminate between the two, these two things. And then we come to the issue of governance and the yeah. bad quality of directors. Now that's part of the whole governance issue yeah. in India. Everything is uh, gone down. Uh, but at the same time, I'll talk about a corporate bank in 80s when Reserve Bank came to me, this is Delhi Corporate Bank, they say it's the worst bank in the country. I said, well, then do something about it, you know. They said, we can't do anything about it because if there's a run on the bank, then, you know, the whole banking system collapses. I said, but then it's your choice, you know, you have to do it, you have to be strict. I have, d I'm not trying to protect that bank uh, as the historic of corporate societies. So the issue is that, you know, there is also a weakness at times with both sides, I mean, I, was, of course I, I, I have of course a... They are. Of course they are, and of course the public sector banks have been a very positive force in development. 
That is no, no doubt about it. I mean, the way the branch network expanded, there's been a lot of economic research which actually says that the reason why the savings rate in India grew, right, is because uh, of the spread of bank branches. I think Koshik Basu himself had a paper, yeah. right, uh, which actually yeah. demonstrates this. Journal of Economic Empirically, it's, yeah. an, it's an empirical yeah. paper which de demonstrates this. Mm -hmm. So I don't think there's any doubt about it. But you know, today's, th th those were the days when you didn't have competition from the private sector banks. So you had no counterfactual. Today you have a counterfactual. And because you have a counterfactual and you suddenly find that that counterfactual is doing so well in terms of profits, right, in terms of the ability to raise capital, in terms of valuations, right, that you suddenly begin to realize that you're shortchanging your own banks. So I don't want to take the view that, you know, everything that's happened in history ought not to have happened. I think there's been, there's been a lot of positive uh, developments. But today, right, I think, you know, in our report we talk about three ways of thinking about ownership. There's government as sovereign, there's government as owner, and there's government as investor. <laughs> government as investor only looks at returns that you get financially. Government as owner finds that that's important, but also has a few development objectives it wants. And government, government as sovereign does everything. We've actually managed these banks in a government as sovereign Sorry. role. And I think we now need to move initially to government as owner and eventually to government as uh, an investor. Eventually this is taxpayers' money and we don't seem to worry about the returns to taxpayers. In our report we show how there have been deeply negative returns that the government has earned on its investment in public sector banks. Deeply negative returns. And yet it puts in more capital year after year. No private sector investor would do that. Okay, well please join me in giving Dr. Nayak a big round of applause. <laughs> Thank you very much. That ends the. I really don't want to stand between uh, you and dinner, but I think this has been a gripping lecture. So, on behalf of ICRIA, on behalf of everybody, the ICRIA family, all our sponsors, let me thank uh, Dr. Naik profusely for this, I think, a very gripping, stimulating, and as Professor said, a very illuminating uh, talk. And we'll wait to see how competition between, or lack of it, between the two. Uh, categories of banks in India evolves. But before we go for dinner, uh, I would really like uh, Purva to come up on stage and present uh, Dr. Naik a bouquet as a token of our appreciation. May I request Purva to also do the same for Chetan? Chetan, as you know, was uh, with Ikriya, so we treat him, still treat him as family. <laughs> Thank you, Chetan. Thank you, Dr. Naik. Uh, may I request all of you to join us for drinks, I guess, and dinner? Thank you. <laughs>